Hi everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel video chess training. I'm International Master William Pascal. Today guys we're going to be taking a look at part three of my series on hyper accelerated dragon post-mortem analysis. Ongoing discussion of practical games I've played in the variation that goes e4, c5, knight f3, g6, d4, pawn takes d4, and queen takes d4, entering properly the so-called hyper-accelerated dragon. Other variations will transpose to the normal accelerated dragon. So this is really the meat of the hyper-accelerated dragon, this line with queen takes d4. Um, now, I just wanted to mention, every time I do a video, kind of mention something a little offbeat and passing, give you some creative ideas. Here, when I was preparing for the video, I noticed that the Grandmaster from Spain, Bayon Lopez, Manuel has played... <laughs> it seems weird, but he's played F6 in the past on a number of occasions. And this is an interesting move that I think you know would be good to play in a blitz game or maybe a rapid game to just kind of throw your opponent off. So something off the wall to think about if a respected Spanish Grandmaster could play this move on numerous occasions, I think it's worth a look. You basically go into a kind of Marazzi in most cases. White will play like c4, and then knight to c6, queen goes back. And there are a number of games after d6, knight to c3, knight h6, and you set up this rat kind of formation with knight h6, knight f7, bishop g7, and f5 later. And although it looks ridiculous, I just thought in passing I'd notice notice this for you that um, not really unplayable for black kind of an interesting alternative if you ever want to throw a kind of curveball out there for your opponents but of course in most cases we're going to play the best move the only good move knight to f6 and this time around we're going to look at a line that starts with the move e5 we're going to focus on that here in part three the other moves we talked about briefly um, now, knight c6 is sort of the only move here. Knight g8 is pretty passive. So, knight to c6, and now white has most often played queen a4. Queen f4 is another line. Um, queen f4, knight d5, queen e4 is a main line. We're not going to go over that today, but it does arise from this position. We're going to look at queen a4 and knight to d5, and now, again, queen e4. Is, is another line. We're going we're gonna to look at queen b3 today. Queen b3 is not as popular as queen e4. It's not in the center and the queen looks slightly vulnerable on b3, slightly immobile that it can't retreat uh, back along the diagonal a4, d1, but uh, it's actually a dangerous line. And I recall as long as 20 years ago when I looked at this with Grandmaster Roman Jinjiashvili we were working on this variation quite a bit for black for a brief time and queen b3 was a move he just sort of mentioned off the cuff he was like bill just um yeah this move also might be something interesting but we never talked about it more and i never really studied it and i never really ran into it in practice until a few weeks ago it's a move that's just been over kind of looked by all the other variations that are at white's disposal but queen b3, 20 years ago, we thought it was dangerous. It remains a problem if black isn't prepared, as happens to me. This happened to me uh, two weeks ago in a first Saturday uh, Budapest Rapid Tournament against the very strong young Mongolian woman player um, Erdin Nomin. So Erdin Nomin is, is rated around 2490 FIDE. And she beat me in a very important game in the last round of a rapid tournament where basically it turned out I only needed a half point to win the tournament and this was a variation she hammered out queen a4 queen b3 very quickly and um, I have to admit I was kind of flat-footed here because I forgot and maybe I never really knew that well what I'm supposed to do so it turns out that this had been played I think against me many many years ago in one game um, but it was a draw. I didn't remember it that well. And um, I went with the kind of standard approach in that game. In this game, I wanted to try something different. 
and I was starting to get my mind confused between the variations with queen e4 and queen b3. There are some similarities, but some very big differences, and, uh, and over the board, I made a terrible mistake. I tried to play knight b6, which is an interesting move. It's going to be the feature of this, this video, basically. But in the game, after knight b6, um, white played bishop f4. And um, in, this, in this position, after bishop f4, what we need to do is play very actively in the center with d6. We'll go over this in more detail. But against uh, Nomin Erdin, I played without a real plan. I played bishop g7. And um, I got a very bad position after knight to c3, castles. Castle's queen side, queen c7, trying to put pressure on e5. White has a very, very big advantage because of knight b5, queen b8, and then queen e3 here. So I'm basically practically lost after 12 moves. So this is what happens when you're not prepared in a, in a sharp position. Um, I was guilty of not being well prepared. So we're going to go over this line in some detail. But before we get started, I want to give you an impression of what the options are here, really, because there are three different moves for black. The least explored is e6, and I think that e6 is playable. Um, I don't know that Leiko played a lot of accelerated dragons, but there's an even, even a Leiko game where he played e6. And I'm not a big fan of e6. I think, I think it looks like a kind of weird c3 Sicilian type of position to me. But um, it appears appears playable as like as a kind of I don't know backup option. Um, it would be my last choice, but it's fully playable after c4. Knight back to e7 probably best to avoid playing something weird like knight to b6, where the knight can get hit again. Two passive on c7, so knight e7, knight c3, bishop g7, bishop f4, and castles. When black is basically planning to break out with f6 at some point, this position is, in my humble opinion, slightly better for for white. Black can also play maybe something interesting like queen a5 instead of castling. But um, if this is a position that, that's comfortable for you, I think that it's playable for black. But I like the other options a little bit better. So let's talk about the other lines. Um, knight to c7, this is what I played years ago. And um, what I think um, feels like the safest. Because the knight comes to c7, to e6 in a lot of lines to kind of guard the a2, g8 diagonal. Um, it's always an interesting question in, in such English openings and whatnot. Whether you should put the knight on, on b6 or c7 or c2 or um, b3 and uh, it's never an easy answer the knight on b6 is slightly more exposed but somehow seems a little bit more active whereas the knight on c7 it uh, gets closer to the center with moves like knight e6 so it's it's kind of a matter of taste you have to study the individual line you're looking at but knight c7 is fully playable a very solid option for example grandmaster eugene perlstein who also worked with uh, Roman Jinji Ashvili and, and even myself at the same time years ago on this opening, plays knight c7 or has played knight c7 on a regular basis. He's a pretty strong practitioner of the accelerated dragon. Um, but knight c7 is, uh, is not that fun. I mean, white can play bishop c4, and the line is, is pretty straightforward, I think, here. Um, bishop c4, knight e6, basically forced, and then white could castle or play bishop takes e6. If you play bishop takes e6, which is the main line, I think probably best, we have a branch here. Um, bishop takes e6, most recommended after bishop takes e6 is um, f takes e6. I'm sorry, not f takes e6, d takes e6. And this is the standard way of playing the position. I was thinking it's interesting to play f takes e6, but there's some risk involved. I looked at the following variation. f takes e6, there's just a couple of games in the database where f takes e6 has been played, and um, it looks to me like the position could end up in a situation where black has hanging pawns in the center that are a little bit hard to kind of keep protected. So 
let's look at this for a minute here. F takes e6, bishop f4, bishop g7, and this is the variation I looked at, which seems pretty forced. Castles, castles, bishop g3, and this is obviously a bad piece on g3, but black also has some issues, you know, how to free his position. So I don't know if it's possible to play something like b6, bishop b7 here. I guess it's something to consider, but the more natural move is d5. When my concern is that after e takes d6, e takes d6, knight b2, you see these pawns on e6 and d6. Computer engines may find tactical ways of holding this position together for black, but I think in practice it's a little more difficult for black to play um, than for white. So I, I'm going to recommend taking back with a d-pawn in that structure if you play this line with knight c7. But by the same token, I think that this is playable for black if you're very inventive. Um, d5, for example, rook fe1, and then we have to be very creative here not to avoid white getting this like Nimzovician sort of like total vice on the position on e5 and making the bishop bad on c8. So you have to find the move rook f5, and after rook ad1, queen f6. So black playing like in a French defense tarash. He's using his queen rook, everything he can think of, um, to kind of guard the e5 square, you know, avoiding white, basically taking over that, that point and getting a Nimzovician kind of blockade. Um, c3, queen f7, knight f1. The rook is a little awkward on f5. You're basically going to have to play like an engine to kind of hold black's position together. So it's creative and interesting, but I think I'm going to recommend d takes e6 here which is the solid move played by Perlstein, other strong players. Um, D takes e6, and now white continues, most often with bishop f4 over protecting e5, and now bishop g7, when white usually castles. He could play knight c3, but he usually castles, and black here normally castles. This is how one game, um, I am Pruis versus Perlstein went. A lot of other games as well, that's just one. Here, black also can play queen a5. But I have a new idea here that I was looking at that's kind of interesting. Um, the main line goes something like castles. But you can also play b6, making you know a path for the bishop, which can come to b7. So b6, for example, knight to c3, bishop b7, fantastic white squared bishop here. And rook on a to d1. This move seems to be so critical in so many lines of the hyper-accelerated dragon. Queen c8, where the queen supports um, bishop a6. It participates in threats on the long diagonal eventually. Uses the c line. Sidesteps knight b5. Rook on f to e1. And I think simply castles. I'm not going to go out on a limb and say black's better. I think I'd prefer to play black here with the two bishops and a pretty compact pawn structure. White's e5 pawn is kind of a liability and his bishop on f4 is a little bit dead. So I kind of like black with the bishop pair, but I'm going to say it's equal. Going back in this line a little bit, he can also, instead of playing um, this way, after d takes e6, um, yeah, he can simply play instead bishop f4. Bishop f4, but it's going to castle um, next move probably. So I don't think that the move order difference between bishop f4 and castles really makes a big difference. So this is interesting. The other way they can go is that white doesn't take on e6. He plays instead castles here. Now this is not as common. Bishop takes e6 is what most people play. But it is possible for white to castle here. And let's see, what, what do we do after castles? Bishop g7. Let's see if we can find that. Castles. Bishop g7 is, is kind of standard. But um, there's another idea here for black, which is, I guess, the, the reason most people take on e6, which is knight a5. I guess this is, this is good. Knight a5. And queen moves, knight takes c4, queen takes c4, and b6. Again, the bishop on the long diagonal just gives huge play. Rook to d1, bishop b7, 
knight c3, rook c8. This is the line I analyzed. You can also take on f3 right away instead for black. So looks very good for black. Queen a4, bishop takes f3, for example, g takes f3, and uh, not even defending the pawn on a7 here, just playing bishop g7, because this pawn on e5 is more important than that pawn on a7. So this, I guess, isn't really a critical line. Um, white usually taking on e6 to avoid the threat of knight a5 and knight takes c4. So in summary, I mean, I think this knight c7 line is is totally okay for black. And um, there's one more line we need to look at before we close the chapter on that. And this is bishop f4 instead of bishop c4. Also not a problem because after knight e6, bishop g3. This bishop is very suspect and difficult to get in the game on g3. And here uh, we can follow a game played in 2004, bishop g7 knight to c3, and then an exchange of pieces with knight e d4, knight takes d4, knight takes d4, queen a4, and then it looks a little passive black retreating here, but the position is totally okay. Um, white could ca castle queenside sack a pawn here with knight, knight takes e5 for black, but I'm not sure if, if there really is enough compensation, some for sure, uh, but mostly queen e4 is uh, the logical move. And we follow the game Rosito versus Nadilski from 2004. I'm guessing that was played in Argentina. Castles, and then bishop b5. Castles queenside is okay for black there too. Now, in that game, black was fine. He played a6, bishop takes c6, d takes c6. Uh, maybe black went on to lose this game, but not because of the opening. After castles kingside, bishop f5, black has the bishop pair, and if anything, black is better here. But um, my gut instinct is that white should probably hold a draw. So that's that game, but I was coming up with a new idea here. After this bishop g3, there's a very interesting uh, pawn move that is played sometimes in lines where white plays the queen to e4 on move, um, move 7. And that's b5. This is a very interesting pawn sacrifice that I believe has never been played before. But it makes a lot of sense. Um, the bishop has a6, b7 squares. There's a minority attack theme going on for black. And uh, it, it sort of threatens to flank the knight on c3 with b4 in some lines. So I analyzed this. It looks completely sound for black. b5, and um, white can take or play knight bd2, probably the best moves. If bishop takes b5, it leads to fantastic complications. I looked at knight on e to d4, four king, queen, and bishop, queen a4, and then knight takes b5 when we go to a position where I think black is fine. We can also play um, bishop takes b5 and rook b8, pinning the bishop, queen a4, and now there's a long tactical sequence here that's very cute but very complicated. Um, knight to c5, queen c4 only move, queen a5 check, knight c3 only move, and then bishop a6, and white has a really shocking move here, e6, which makes this line a little bit risky for black. A lot risky, but objectively probably okay. Um, just very sharp. So rook takes b5. Analyzing this, it's unclear. e takes d7. I don't want to take this pawn with my king. I'm going to play king d8. This is... I'm gonna go like on the fence here and say it's it's unclear. Um, I don't know if this is good or not, but it's worth giving it a try. Um, very complicated position. So that's that line and b5 after bishop g3. If bishop f4, knight e6, bishop g3, b5 is I think a really interesting novelty. And um, if white instead declines it with knight on b to d2. Then we have um, bishop h6, I think, here with a very active development for black. Bishop h6, again, I looked at bishop takes b5. And I don't think it's very great for white. I mean, knight on e to d4, queen a4, we grab the bishop, queen takes b5, rook b8. Going to get the pawn on b2. So queen d3, rook takes b2. Black is at least equal here, um, and I think that's that's a very pessimistic kind of um, judgment. I mean, I don't want to say like black's always better, black's always better, but 
this position is good for black. So b5, a very interesting um, pawn sacrifice option there. So knight c7 is interesting, and I think it's, it's a totally okay line. But we're going to focus primarily on the move I played in the game, um, knight to b6. And here, it's uh, a little bit provocative, knight b6, because it um, leaves this diagonal open without the possibility, the a2 g8 diagonal, without the possibility of white, um, sorry, black playing knight e6 to block the threats. It stops bishop c4 directly. But white has a tricky move that they can play here. White has a lot of moves in this position. I mean, bishop f4, as in the game where I lost, um, you know, maybe routine development somehow. Not a lot of time, though. I guess you can, you can play knight c3, probably. But um, the main lines are bishop f4 and the interesting move a4 which is an attempt to really punish the knight on b6 take advantage of its exposed position on b6 gain some time for the white rook so a4 has been played before but there's another move here that's very tricky the sort of emil satovsky like variation knight g5 he likes these crazy lines that he can analyze very deeply um, knight to g5 which is not that easy, I guess, for black to um, to answer. We have to be a little bit careful here in this line with knight to g5. So if you play knight takes e5 in this position, there is there's a very serious danger of um, bishop f4. Let me see if I can bring this up. Bishop f4 which overloads the knight on e5. So black is actually going to lose material right away. So the natural knight takes e5 loses a piece or loses significant material. So black has to play e6 instead, which weakens the squares d6 and f6. So we have to be very, very careful here. Knight e4, and this is already a little trappy. If we play knight takes e5, um, bishop g5, bishop e7. I'm not sure this has ever happened in a game before, but it's a very forcing line. Bishop e7, knight d6, check. King f8, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, and now queen a3, supporting that knight that ties up black's entire position. Something like um, in the floor mechanist variation of the English that Kasparov played with white knight on d6. So it's not real pleasant for black, this, this particular position. Um, after this, I guess knight d5, c4, and knight f6. We can try to get rid of the knight with knight, knight e8, but my judgment here is that this is an unpleasant, kind of tricky position that I would prefer to avoid with black. So we're going to play not this, but a better move after knight e4, queen c7. And I, I attach an exclamation point to this move. I think that black is threatening knight d4, winning outright, as well as the e5 pawn. So white has nothing better than the following move, which is knight d6 check, sacrificing a pawn for the bishop pair. Black has some weaknesses, but I don't think there's anything to lose sleep over. My main line is kind of speculative variation. Bishop takes d6, pawn takes, queen takes check, forced. And now the c3 Sicilian asks knight a3. White has some play here, but I don't think that black should be in any immediate danger. Um, castles, knight b5, queen e5 check. And then white could trade queens here with queen e3, but black has to be okay upon up trading queens. So if white wants to play for a win um, in this line, I guess bishop b2 which would allow a6, and then I analyzed f4, queen e4, hitting the key pawn on g2. And uh, we've got to be careful because the knight on b6 is hanging. Knight d6, queen takes g2, bishop f3, and queen h3. This is a little shaky, but I mean, black is up material, and I, I have to believe that at the very least, um, black has equal chances here. So the jury's out on this. Uh, you don't have to necessarily um, play the exact moves in this variation. You can probably find some improvements for black. 
but I think Queen C7 pretty much takes the steam out of this interesting gambit line for white. So going back, knight g5 is kind of coffee house style, but interesting. Um, we're going to look at the main line here and a4. Let's start with a4. a4 is um, a4 has been played in a number of games. Let me see if I can find it. Now a4. Where is it? There it is. A4. And one game I noticed in my database was this great senior game between um, two kind of well-known senior players. This was a few years ago. Uh, Tatai against Chernikov from 2003. But both of them were strong masters in their prime. So it, it actually made for a kind of entertaining game, but an interesting game. Chernikov, an old player who actually kind of played the hyper accelerated dragon he was really one of the first players who made a kind of career out of playing the hyper accelerated dragon so a strong i am and into his like i don't know 70s he's i don't know if he's still around but he was as of 2003 still playing very strongly um now my recommendation here is different from the move that chernikov played chernikov played d5 it's very interesting and um I think you know you're going to play knight to c4 in some lines with the Chernikov's move order, but basically I would recommend d6. Um, we're going to try to break the center like in Alec. This is very similar to Alekhine's defense. Try to destroy the center. So d5 is interesting. I recommend d6. In the Chernikov game, it just transposes because Tatai played um, e takes d6, and um, after e takes d6. This is uh, quite an interesting position. So let me find that here. E takes d6. We could sacrifice a pawn, I guess, with bishop g7 here. That is yet to be explored. But safest is, I suppose, in this line, um, queen takes d6. And then a5. Bishop e6, this leads to incredible complications, and I'm not sure, um, you know, I really want to go here. It was an entertaining game. Tatai Chernikov, queen c3, castles queen side, and then Tatai maybe made an inaccuracy here. He played bishop d3 to stop the mate, but my analysis is bishop d2 is a big improvement when black has a lot to prove. Um, black basically sacks the rook at h8 with knight d5, queen takes h8, and uh, this wasn't played, but this is best play for both sides. Bishop g4, bishop e2, bishop takes f3, g takes f3, um, bishop h6, trying to trap the queen, the queen goes out to h7, bishop takes d2 check, knight takes d2, and I mean, I'm sure Chernikov has analyzed these kind of positions in, in his laboratory somewhere over the years, uh, but it's not quite sound after knight f4, knight e4, queen before check. There's this fascinating position that arises now, king f1, and you know you see black is a rook down here. So black actually has counterplay after knight takes e2 in the event of king takes e2, but white has this inner mezzo in this line, queen takes f7 which is winning, probably winning for white, um, who's basically up at least the exchange, maybe a rook. This is a, a just a funny position I want to stop and show uh, the viewers because it's it's just an ironic kind of position because this knight is trapped like in mid-board here. Um, the knight on e2 actually has nowhere to go because knight d4 will allow c3 in some lines. But anyway, the Tatai Chernikov game is kind of coffee house. Um, I'm not going to recommend this. This interesting, complicated, lots of sacrifices and, and crazy positions. Um, I think after e takes d6, you know, black um, can opt to try to develop with something like bishop g7. And um, in any case, the main line is is e takes d6 
here. So another line that can um, e takes d6, bishop g7. Another line that can come up is a5, which is very complicated. Um, after d6, which is our preferred move order, e takes d6. Um, white could instead play a5 right here on move 9. And this was played in a game where black played highly creatively with bishop e6. No, no, he played knight e7. I, I'm giving a new idea here with bishop e6. Um, this has never been played before. Okay, so the game went knight d7, which is fine um, for black. Knight to d7. But the continuation, e takes d6, bishop g7, um, d takes e7. White has other moves there. He could play bishop g5 or bishop e2 or knight c3. Um, but the game, Kakimov versus Demkovich, 2004, d takes e7. This seems like reasonable play for both sides. Queen takes e7, check, bishop e3, castles, knight c3. And then a very good move for black, knight on d to e5. Black is a pawn down, but this is one of those variations when we start to to really wonder about that queen on b3. You know, is it that well placed? It seems like it's prone to getting attacked. Knight takes e5, and I thought that Demkovich played very, very well here. Queen takes e5, and in the actual game, Kakima versus Demkovich, white played queen b5, and I think that black had a big improvement over that game which wasn't played in the game. I'm not sure what white played or black played in that position, but rook d8 uh, right here. This move cuts white in half down the d file and um, it seems to equalize for black. Black has compensation. Um, queen takes e5, bishop takes e5, bishop d3, and then knight b4. Pawn down, but we've got clear compensation. And then after the logical bishop e4, Black could play f5, even bishop f5. And I looked at bishop takes f5, g takes f5, the c2 pawn is falling, castles, knight takes c2, and rook d1. And Black is not winning, or even better, but he's also not losing. So it, it looks like, um, I think in this position, actually knight d4 is probably best. But um, the white pawn is a little overextended on a5. The black has a little weakness on f5. Interesting line, but I, I think that black has enough resources in all these kind of complicated variations with a4. So a4, very creative. I think d6, I prefer to d5. d5 is interesting. Um, but d6 is, is probably the, the best answer um, to a5. And, the interesting novelty I prepared here is is a5, bishop e6. So knight e7 is okay, bishop e6, and we enter a very funny variation um, after bishop e6. Queen b5. Let me see if I can find it. Queen b5. Black's in danger of losing a piece. Knight d5. You see b7 is hanging. But I'm not sure that that is necessarily that dangerous. Um, a6 is the focus of my analysis when black has the cool move queen d7. And I realize this is complicated, guys, and you may not get you know all of this stuff, but examine what you can, take a look, see what you think. Don't forget to comment and question in the, in the chat on YouTube. Queen takes b7, and there's a very cute variation here. We're sacrificing a pawn, but rook c8 and I found compensation for black here bishop b5 rook c7 queen a8 check rook c8 and obviously this is a draw if white wants one slight drawback here bishop takes c6 rook takes a8 bishop takes d7 king takes d7 and now e takes d6 we need to keep this pawn in the center so e takes d6 to guard the king on d7 but in the in the position here where the smoke clears, we have this kind of cool position where Black's king is centralized for the ending. He has he or she has two bishops, a lot of open lines, and it looks to me like good compensation for the sacrificed pawn. Castles, 
bishop g7, rook d1, and then rook b8. And although white is okay here, I think we have to see this other rook coming to c8. Black has very active play. So in the spirit of the accelerated dragon, active counterattacking kind of play, I think black has compensation for material. Um, a4 is an interesting move. Again, I'm, I'm going on, you know, kind of a wing and a prayer here because there's just not a lot of practical examples with a4. I mean, these two games I mentioned are two of really the only games, um, the only good games that have been played in the variation with a4. But if we go back to, we go back to our original position here, our focus of the video today is on the main line, knight to b6, and instead of knight to g5, bishop f4. This is how I lost this game to Nomen Erdain, and I didn't react. I just didn't react quickly. I thought, okay, I'll just automatically play bishop g7 and castles. Actually, maybe that's okay. Maybe you can play bishop g7 and even castle, but no matter what happens here, there's no time to move the queen on d8, and you must, absolutely must, break the center with d6, which is what I didn't do, and that's what cost me, and I lost because I tried to play without d6. You cannot play without d6. It was decisive for me in this tournament, so we've got to play d6 sooner or later. You can play bishop g7 and d6 later. I recommend getting it out of the way, playing it right away. Um, d6, and e takes d6 really is the only serious move for white here. I mean, you're trying to punish black by busting up the structure. So e takes d6, and um, you could you could play bishop g7. I think this is a good move. Bishop g7, um, knight to c3, pawn takes e7, queen takes e7, check. Um, knight to c3, castles, queenside castles, and now in this interesting position, we have one grandmaster who played with white. My own friend, Tejas Bakre, um, did play back in 2005 one game in this position. But here, there, there are several games where black didn't take on d6 in either game, which may be a good move, actually. Uh, this, this position could be reached by a couple different move orders, depending on when black played bishop g7, castles, and d6. But this is the basic idea. You've got to get in d6, and don't be afraid to take on d6. Um, one one player played this crazy move. Uh, Ian Rogers was white in a game where her, his opponent played e5. I mean, this is this is insane. It's like resigning because white has a protected pass pawn on d6. So that's not an option. Um, here, you know, Rogers just got a free point there after e5. There was this interesting game, Bakre versus Wang Shuo, 2005. Bishop e6, fully playable for black. And Tay just played queen b5 here. And that's fine. I mean, that's one totally okay move. But I think he could play better with queen a3. Queen a3 makes some sense. I mean, the, the queen's on the dark square. And if you do something like knight c4, white will just hack it off with the bishop. Kind of be glad that there's, you know, a knight gone. And white can focus on playing in the dark squares. So queen a3 looks like a slight improvement. It obviously accentuates white's control over d6. Um, and I analyzed here an interesting line. e takes d6. White can take either way. If bishop takes d6, what's our universal move? Queen c8. And the beauty of this one is the queen gets trapped on a3. After bishop takes f8, bishop takes f8. And it's like very sweet, you know. Um, Bishop takes f8, bishop takes f8, queen trapped on a3. But that's not the point here. Obviously, white knows better than to to do that. So after queen c8, I think that the business-like move is h4. And I'm going to say unclear. Um, black has compensation for the sacrificed pawn. So white's a bit awkwardly placed with the queen on a3. I think black has sufficient compensation. And it's a dragon with very active pieces for black, so... I, I don't mind this. The other line that white can play is um, after e takes d6, rook takes d6. And rook takes d6 
is also okay for black. I analyzed this quite a bit. Um, queen takes e7, sorry, queen to e7, queen a3 again, our favorite move, and now bishop e6, bishop d3, and in this line, the rook on d6 is rather awkward, so black has for, there's other moves, but for one thing, knight c8, uh, forcing a retreat, or the following move, knight to d5, there is no retreat, actually, the rook is trapped. So only move knight to d5, bishop takes d5, rook takes d5, queen takes a3, we smash the white structure, and um, I think that's enough right there, that white is not really going to get an advantage here. BA, knight to b6. And now rook d6, or maybe rook b5, and kind of keeping an eye on the b7 pawn. But rook on f to d8. Fundamentally, black's position seems very sound. On the other rooks coming to c8, we have uh, pawn down, but it's an isolated double pawn. A very good fianchetto bishop. Rook d7, if necessary, to guard the b7 pawn. So the black knight can go back to d5. I can't imagine that black doesn't have compensation for the sacrificed pawn here, guys. So that's that's it. It looks like in all lines, um, we we've got interesting counterplay in um, in this in this opening, and I think objectively, there's really nothing else to look at. I mean, you really need to to study it your own, you know, you study it yourselves on your own. But uh, there's so many interesting possibilities. Um, really here for black that deserve analysis. I couldn't possibly pack all the possibilities into one video, but I did want to um, make sure we went over everything that's relevant here. So I would try to avoid, uh, in particular, certain variations where, like, this bishop on g7 gets traded off. There are some lines where white can manage to do that kind of exchange, and I, w I would definitely avoid that. So the basic idea is, in this variation where I lost, um, what we're trying to do is destroy the pawn on e5, even if it means sacrificing a pawn for black. The white queen is not really well placed on b3, and we're going to focus on development for black and not material. So I think if you play accurately, you get in d6, you've got to have adequate compensation for this pawn. I mean, we're not necessarily trying to take the pawn back. Although, um, you know, this is also playable after d6, pawn takes d6, um, we, we can also do e takes d6. This, this is an interesting variation that we should finally take a look at uh, before we actually end the video. So e takes d6, and um, I think in this position, black can, black can play as well with, with ideas of d5. It's not my preferred approach, but... Um, I think that black would, would be able to, to get like a decent position developing slowly bishop bishop g7, bishop e6, or d5. So e takes d6 is also also an option here for black. But I mean it's it's a little easier to just sacrifice the pawn and uh, with bishop g7 and um, just castle and, and transpose to the variation we looked at with knight c3, castles, castles, and pawn takes d6. I think this position is absolutely playable for black. So give it a try, and um, we will um, we will continue with part four of this series a little bit further down the line. A lot of other possibilities in this queen takes d4 variation of the hyper-accelerated dragon. In particular, the, the brother of this variation, I think next we'll look at queen e4 on move six, if we show that position here. Uh, instead of queen b3, Basically, white can play queen e4. So, in the next part of the series, we'll take a look at queen e4, which I think objectively, it feels a little bit more correct than putting the queen on b3 as the uh, as the player I lost to at the recent rap tournament did. But anyway, it should give you some ammo if you face the move queen b3 in any kind of serious game. Thanks, everybody, for joining me here at uh, my YouTube channel, Video Chess Training. I'm International Master William Pascal with part four of Hyper Accelerated Dragon Postmortem Analysis. Sorry, this was part three. Part four coming up. And don't forget to uh, subscribe and leave a, and leave a like um, for us here so we can continue and create more material on YouTube. Thanks a lot and bye-bye.